uh, that we were discussing uh, the last week. So um, that all those changes were put on hold until the end of this year, you know, to be reevaluated. So, you know, we're, we'll still we, that gives us, us the rest of the year. If anyone's challenges in court or if the administration decides to uh, shelf this rule and, you know, whatever it might be, it, like we said last week, they're still evaluating this rule and a lot of other rules. Uh, and the 60 day moratorium for this rule wasn't <clears throat> enough. So that's why they extended the, this until the end of the year. Yeah, thank you. Lucas. actually we had a, some technical issue the before it was not have the audio. Just we are discussing about today topic, uh, the fiscal year H1B cap 2022 and uh, the 485 adjustment of status who filled in October about their kids is coming crossing the 21 years. Uh, we can we can discuss today is the Biden new administration uh, uh, implementation plan. I think uh, I see the couple of uh, news on today. Uh, Biden sent the new immigration plan to the Congress. And also we discussed about the per country quota. Um, uh, these are the topics today. It means I'm requesting to everyone Please participate uh, every witness day show and uh, please do call to show. We provided the conference number on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Just uh, hang up and dial, dial and uh, directly connect to Lucas and get more information from directly from Lucas. All, or else, if you are busy, just uh, post uh, your question on Facebook and uh, YouTube. We can address your questions. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. So, what is a uh, uh, is there any update uh, Biden immigration plan? Well, uh, yes. So uh, Dick Durbin, a senator, and also Senator Lindsey Graham have uh, put together a proposed uh, immigration plan uh, that is in part uh, is addressing the dreamers, um, which would be people who have DACA and also certain TPS holders that have uh, TPS stands for temporary protected status. Uh, you know, and, and this is a good sign uh, for what we discussed a few weeks back, even going back into last October, where we were talking about comprehensive immigration reform. What does this mean? How would it impact us uh, specifically in employment based immigration uh, categories? So, you know, in the past, when when something like this comes about for uh, comprehensive immigration reform, we look to maybe rectify all the, the issues uh, at one time and one bill. Uh, everything's discussed. Everything uh, goes through, you know, the House representatives and then Congress and then the president signs. You know, we can add amendments or <clears throat> small changes as needed. Uh, Joe Biden, President Biden this time, has actually uh, been really vocal and open about uh, what we would call like a piecemeal strategy. And what this means is, uh, A, we're going to send this piece of legislation through affecting this group or this, this issue within uh, in this circumstance, like for the dreamers or whatever else that can be debated and discussed. And next we'll send another uh, bill through that will, uh, you know, maybe address the backlog and employment based categories. So they're, they're more or less separate subjects, which, which bodes extremely well uh, for, you know, most people that are stuck in this backlog where we, we actually have pretty good hope that if that's the case, um, if there's any negativity or bad publicity or, you know, certain Republicans don't buy into this one plan over here, you know, pretty confident with the employment based uh, backlog and these issues where we can say, you know, there, there's a lot of STEM candidates here that are in school that they should have an easier path to go from you know, F1 to H1B to uh, GC, whatever that might be, how, how long ever, ever long that might take, we want to have, we want to retain that talent. So that's easier to sell maybe to, to people in the other party or to, to the public uh, rather than, you know, a quote unquote, like an amnesty that would benefit just anyone. Uh, so a lot of these uh, issues are, are actually trending positive. You know, the, another big point that came out from uh, President Biden's uh, list of things that we need to address is the aging out of these kids that 
have been have pretty much grown up there here in America that came here as young children legally with their parents. Uh, parents are in H-1B status. Kids are in H-4 status. Now the kids are graduating high school, going to college. Uh, parents have just recently filed for adjustment of status. How can we protect the kid from aging out? Uh, which means the kid turns 21, no longer is able to qualify as a derivative under the parent's uh, application and uh, I-140 petition. So these are very important uh, issues that are coming up, you know, we'll have more clarity in the next co couple of weeks to months. Um, but these are the issues that I think if they're piecemealed, meaning each, uh, issues its own separate bill going through Congress, we have a higher chance of having these approved and passed, uh, than if we just try and put everything, cram everything together in one box and send it through. Okay. Lucas, we discuss um, about the child age in December. We know that if any kid cross twenty one years, they will not. Uh, they will. They they have to have uh, change the status H four to the F one. Though, if if any parent want to keep the child uh, under the green card. The what is the best way to um, log the date? Maybe you can, maybe when they can log the date, whether uh, 485, adjust, 485 adjustment of status application date or 485 uh, final action date. So what you're asking uh, is basically how can we get these uh, applications moving uh, to protect a, a child from aging out. Now, we, we do have certain uh, regulations where uh, maybe a, for employment-based um, applications where if someone falls out of status or something happens, there's a six-month uh, period that, that's uh, able to receive a waiver. So if there is an issue falling out of status between H4 to F1, you know, there is a cure for that. Now, there is also a cure. We have something else called the Child Status Protection Act, which, you know, if there's delay in processing the actual adjudication of the case, that we could recapture that time. Uh, issue is on that, there's not really much recapturing of time on uh, processing of these cases because uh, just because we can file the application doesn't necessarily mean there's been delay in processing the application if the final action date has not come current. So I think, you know, for a lot of the candidates, and I've suggested this, you know, to people who were filing last year, and it's really a case by case decision. I've always encouraged all my clients to go ahead and file uh, for a child, even if it's uh, close to, you know, the date's close to, to the end of aging out, uh, for the simple fact that if we have something pending, and this year something changes where we, you know, this issue is addressed and, and changed in, by law. Uh, if we have a pending application at that time, there's a higher chance that that person or that, that child will be taken care of under these new provisions where we don't lose an opportunity. Now, there's no guarantee and I can't tell you for sure what's going to happen. But, there, you know, there's a high probability if something does come about. Uh, you know, we're at least giving the kids the best uh, opportunity possible to, to be included with the parents' uh, GC application. Let's say, Lucas, if any parent want to, let's say, uh, a primary applicant apply the the 485 adjustment status on October, their kid is maybe the 20 years and six months, maybe another six months, say, turning out to 21 years, if they want to protect their child, uh, they, um, my question is: uh, If if can we do it? Well, you said is we can uh, apply to the USCIS, or maybe you can um, um, apply to USCIS to log the date. Is there any simplified uh, way to approach our? Uh, approach to the attorney or approach to the USCS to protect or protect their child under 
adjustment of 485? Well, there's a few different uh, parameters that, that can be used potentially for this. Now, I, I want to back up and just remind everyone what we've always discussed in this forum uh, is that we don't want to say everyone falls under one category. Uh, when you get into these types of issues, each case is independently unique. Now, what this means is just because it might work for person A, we, we don't want to follow, we, we don't always uh, have the same results on person B. And so what we would need to do is have an uh, individual strategy for each person. And, you know, I, I know I've spoken to a lot of people off uh, this program where they've contacted me offline or through email to answer a few questions. And I try and always emphasize the fact that if you get are getting just a one one sentence answer or response from attorney on a complex issue, that, that's probably not the best uh, route to take uh, or the best person to talk to. Um, you, you need to have someone look at your situation and analyze it for every possible outcome. Now, what this means, is it doesn't mean that you might get a benefit or you might not. What it means is, you know, we need to have, we need to try every possible opportunity that there is. Um, and sometimes some of these opportunities, uh, you know, entail extra work or, or maybe more creative thinking. But, you know, there, there is a lot of outcomes, a lot of different things that could happen that each case would have its own unique uh, set of facts that we would have to analyze to move forward, if that makes sense. Okay. Lucas, I have a question on this one. Uh, even my son will be age out next year in May. So we are now working on changing the status from H4 to F1. As currently the processing time of for CVS in US in more than more than a year. Should we think of getting this done in India? The consulate or Edmunds, he's asking the what is a right. highly appreciate. Yeah, what is the process? Best process. Well, you see. This is another uh, really good question that, that comes up time to time, and I'm uh, glad for whoever sent the question in you know, for bringing it up. Uh, the most important thing is when you're filing to change status from uh, whatever status to uh, F1, uh, you, know, you need to obviously work with the school, get a CVS ID registered, get your, the I-20. Uh, and as long as you're not a visitor, like uh, here on a B-1, B-2 visa, uh, you can go ahead and file a change of status request with USCIS and you can continue going to school because um, the application is going to take approximately eight to nine months. Uh, now, here's the caveat that I always try and bring up to people. We, you know, right now we've had a challenging year uh, with uh, COVID, with pandemic and everything else. And there's been a lot of people who've had to make emergency travel back home. So what this means is if you have a pending uh, application with USCIS for I-539 to extend or change a non-immigrant status, once you depart the United States, that case is automatically going to be denied for abandonment. So what it means is at that point in time, you're still going to have to go through the, the visa stamping process to come back in. So I would say it's not fatal uh, to, to your case if you if you do that and an emergency comes up and you have to travel but there's just extra you know circumstances involved if, if you have the opportunity uh, like a trip's already planned and everything else and the school's already uh, on board getting everything set up maybe it's more straightforward to just go and get stamped and come back in as F1 so you know e each person has their own uh, requirements uh, and you know each case should be looked at individually to, to make sure we meet the expectations of, of those uh, clients. Okay. Okay. The best way I think uh, they should apply the whenever the dates are coming and uh, maybe we are talking about the Biden immigration policy, the employment backlog. Do you have any uh, update on this one? Well, the employment-based backlog is one of the key points that's been brought up for this administration to address. Now, you know, in my point of view, and I'm sure all of our listeners' point of view, all, all these issues are 
more or less uh, as important as one as the others. But, um, you know, we have to remember that a lot of these um, horrible things that happened under President Trump, uh, you know, have to be addressed first. So we have children who are separated from their parents at the border. Uh, there has to be focus, a uh, task force created to help rectify that problem. Uh, there's also, you know, maybe other people impacted by, you know, like these dreamers uh, who are not really in status. They just have permission to work and, uh, you know, pretty much a promise that they won't be put in removal proceedings. Um, that's what deferred action means. So maybe, you know, those are higher priorities than than someone who's here uh, an, under H-1B status waiting for their the GC. Now, in the grand scheme of things, you know, we're talking about maybe weeks, a few weeks delay on each of these, you know, plans before it's implemented. Um, you know, you look back, it'll all seem like it was done at the same time. But, uh, you know, that's that's what we, we hope to hear in the next few weeks. Uh, these plans for, um, you know, especially STEM students uh, this last year, two years, uh, there's been a tremendous uh decline in our F1 students, our foreign students who come here for higher education, specifically masters and above, uh, PhD students. And, you know, our, our model as a country in the past has been to uh, welcome anyone who wants to come to the United States for higher education, because we know that once they're here, A, they're going to have a higher degree that can contribute to society, uh, and B, they're they're probably want to going to want to stay here, and we we should accommodate that as much as possible so we can retain the top talent in the world. That's one of the things that has made America a, a great place, and that's something we can we need to have to continue the growth uh, for our economy and our country. Now, I think that's the key focus of this administration too: is is how can we get this. Uh, uh, profile of, of American education back up to being a world leader or close to the top of being a world leader. And uh, one of the things they can do is, is for STEM students, make it a, an easier pathway, uh, you know, not only going transitioning from F1 to H1B or some other visa, but then also within a foreseeable near future have uh, access to GC or some temporary GC that allows you to uh, have more stability rather than be on a non-immigrant visa for, like an H-1B for 15 or 20 years. Yeah, you're talking about the STEM degree advanced. Uh, do you have any precise path? Uh, maybe USC is going to implement or US, USC is going to will bring this path to simplify the, the international students to get acqu acquired the GC in US. Do you have any idea, Edmunds, as for your experience? You know, right now, I, I don't have an idea. I, I, these are all policies uh, that are are being discussed. So we're, we're at the very beginning of what these policy statements might be. And to go from a policy statement to actually dis debated and discussed and codified, which means, you know, created into law, there's a lot of things that can happen in between. So what typically you want to start out with is just like uh, if you want to compare agile methodology, you know, you want to start out with the overall picture of what is the goal uh, that we want to do. And that that's what this is right here is the main idea of what we want to do. And the, as, as we know, in agile methodology, as we uh, progress from one task to the next, uh, we kind of, you know, flow like water to what's needed and there's always things that come up that were unforeseen or, you know, other things that, that we want to address at a later date. And that's more or less the same process we're following here. Uh, so at the, just, you know, to restate it, we're at the point now where we're introducing policy. It's a typical, it's basically just an idea without all the, the cogs to know how and why it happens. Right. Okay. Lucas, um, the last year, S386 and H1144 uh, bills got approved Senate and, and uh, House, but unfortunately got dead in um, the last year. So if the Biden administration and, and the per country limitation, uh, 
So what is their plan to end this per country per country quota for mainly mainly for Indians and Chinese? Well, so the plan is still, you know, as we said in, in the policy stage, but what I would like to suggest in what we you and I have been talking about Vincap for a few months now is you know what can happen is the, the the legislative branch of our government, the House and the Senate, can you know write a law that says you know we want to clear this backlog uh, for employment based uh, you know uh, GC process. So what we can do is we're going to issue X number of visas that can be allocated to both China and India uh, over the next three years and. After that, these the number of was going to go back to the way it was before. That's one way uh, that's been done in the past. Another way would be uh, we're going to you know slowly uh, take away these these percentages of uh, allocations for each country, the per country cap or per country limitations that we currently have, and we're going to open it up to where uh, anyone can access the visas I, now. Going that route, I don't think that that's as feasible as um, just adding extra visas to get rid of the backlog. And I'll tell you why. A lot of uh, the our immigration system as it currently stands it wants to focus on diversity. And we even have a diversity visa for countries who don't have enough uh, people immigrating here. We have diversity lottery visas to encourage people from all over the world to come here, not just from certain parts. And you know, that's a key factor of what our whole uh, purpose behind our immigration system is, is we want, you know, e equal access to come to the United States. So I think a lot of people want to see that remain uh, the way it is. And I think the, the most efficient and effective way of, of, you know, maybe getting rid of the backlog would be to go ahead and just issue uh, extra visas uh, they can be used to, you know, and they, it, it, this could be in the form of, hey, you, anyone can qualify for this visa if you have I-140 approved and it's been pending for two years. You know, something like that might allow you to move quickly and get the visa. So we'll have to wait and see, you know, how uh, people want to address this after, you know, the policy discussion begins. Okay. Yeah, we are, dis we are discussing about the policies. Do you have any draft policies? Did you... Did you get any draft policies which are going no, to be? Not yet. What we have is basically bullet points of ideas of issues that are going to be addressed. So, you know, it's a, it's a good win right now for uh, most of our listeners just to see that these policies are on the list. Uh, and, and like we said last week and the week before that, uh, as, as these policies progress more to be discussed, you know, that's when we want to start reaching out as a group all of our representatives, all of our senators, uh, coordinating with them and just letting people know uh, how important this is to, to be addressed and in, in, uh, passed into law. Okay. Lucas, just before we discuss about the visa numbers, last year, maybe fiscal 2021, we know that around 260,000 visas added into the employment based. So still, we are in February visa bulletin, the final action date is not moving out, actually. We got a one, of, uh, one question from YouTube from Shivani. What is the chance EB3 final action date reach May 17, 2010? Okay, so there's a chance it could move up to, to that slot. Now, I do want it, all of our listeners to remember, um, due to the pandemic, the unused uh, family-based or even employment-based visas from abroad were reallocated uh, to the employment base, you know, like we predicted last October, uh, to be used at that time. So as we discussed last week with delays and getting receipts and everything else, just, just today, the numbers I read from Aila, uh, with the liaisons who work with the Texas Service Center where a majority of these employment-based adjustments went, there's 415,000 pending adjustment of status cases, applications at the Texas Service Center on the Dallas lockbox. So that's not all people who are here on employment base or anything else. It's just 
that that surge of caseload has caused a delay and we're still uh, receiving receipts and checks being cashed for some cases filed last uh, end of last October, beginning of November. So if you can imagine just the sheer number of cases being processed, it's the same thing for maybe these, uh, the final action dates moving, you know, there's a, basically what happens is this, you file your adjustment of status, uh, case, but because the, the, the filing date became current. Okay. So that means that your application is being processed. It allows you to go ahead and get your employment authorization and advanced parole, but no one's going to actually work on the adjustment of status application until your final action date becomes current. So everything's put in its file. The file's put up on its shelf somewhere and it's waiting there until your priority date becomes current with the final action date. Once that happens, someone has to go get the file again and begin processing and working on those uh, cases. So there's a, usually a, a, a lag once these dates get close, you know, the officers have to go and pull however many, files that are there that meet that requirement and process those cases. So I can see that the cases are the priority date for final action date progressing close to, to, to that date. It's just a matter of uh, how fast these other cases progress, if that makes any sense. Okay. The same, uh, Shivani, have another question about the aging out. If child aging, aging age out can be filed F2B category while student on F1? Well, yes. Once you go to the family-based category, of, of course, if there's a qualifying relative. Now, remember, for F2B, uh, you have to be unmarried, son or daughter of a legal permanent resident. So that means to be a legal permanent resident, that means you've already been approved to have GC in hand. So you wouldn't be permitted to actually file that petition until um, you have your GC in hand, or it's been approved, uh, and then you're looking at restarting over for the priority date. Now, the priority date could be, um, I think right now is 2010 or 12, I think. So it's still some time waiting uh, in that regards. So, but yes, proactively, that's a good idea to do. Um, you know, this, this is where it comes, uh, important to work with an attorney to, to have that collaboration, to know how to best benefit the system so you can uh, take care of the kids. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, listeners and viewers. We are requesting you. If you have any question, you can dial to conference num conference number and, uh, you can ask directly to Lucas. Uh, we are taking questions from you. Already we have a couple of from YouTube we can address one by one. Meanwhile, if you have any, just uh, you can post or you can just you can call and uh, call to conference call and uh, you can ask to Lucas. Thank you. Yeah, Lucas, we have uh, uh, some questions from YouTube, uh, some Naru. My downgrade AOS received date is October. 30th, 2020, and uh, got rejection notice with receipt number for 485 G2 application type fail not completed. So his question is, so because of this other form also rejected 7, 765 and uh, 131, uh, maybe depending all, if uh, 485 got rejected, it associated all applications got rejected, 485, 765 and 131. Mm -hmm. They mentioned the package being returned and please send all pages of your completed application and fee. Uh, payment, payment to the address listed the bottom of the page Q1. Can we, res his question is, can we resubmit even though priority date is not current? The question two is for resubmit application receipt number would be same or different. I'd have to know what was the reason for rejection. Uh, it did not mention it when so the rejection is application type fill not completed. Just so, uh, this is the information. Naru, if you if you're uh, 
uh, saying this you can post uh, or you, you can give the more details so the, we can we will try to give the more elaborated information on this so just in general the, while we're waiting on him just to go over that if if it was rejected because it was incomplete not properly filled out uh, the form um you know that that's an issue uh, another issue i've been receiving updates from myela where we have since since some of these cases are still pending from october if you submit a check uh typically checks are good for 90 days which means three months so we're at uh, november december january with some of these checks uh might uh, you know be becoming stale and so sometimes some of these packages might be uh returned because checks are stale uh that the bank won't honor the check because it's already past 90 days so in this circumstance what we have to do is uh you know find out the reason for the rejection and then notify our uh, our liaison that works with uscis to, to address the issue uh, i know depending on the specific nature of the rejection, there's some rejections we could, that it's possible we could go ahead and uh, rectify and send back because of USCIS error. Uh, but there's other rejections where we might have to wait for the priority date to become current again to refile. It just really depends on the details of the, the rejection. Okay. Mainly his question is, um, can we sub resubmit the rejection 485? Uh, the short, the short answer to that would be not right now. Uh, but again, like I said, the, there's other people working with uh, USCIS. Uh, I, I'm a member of American Immigration Lawyers Association, which re references AILA. And, you know, this is a large group of immigration attorneys. Now, if you can imagine, uh, we get better, better results if we have one person out of all the thousands and thousands of immigration attorneys uh, actually addressing our concerns to uh, USCIS. So we have that person, that's, which is what we call the liaison. And, you know, we get examples from multiple different practitioners uh, to send in recent examples of this happened, this was rejected because of this. And if we see a trend or something that's uh, uh, alarming mistakes from USCIS, that allows us to, uh, you know, work with them to say, you know, if this uh, circumstance A, B, and C happen, we can go ahead and resubmit the package and they'll accept it. So it really depends uh, right now on two factors. The main reason why your case was rejected, number one. Number two, uh, what USCIS might do to uh, rectify that issue. And then, of course, number three would be hopefully the filing dates become current again once the, this backlog uh, is addressed with the lockbox. Like we said a minute ago, there's still... Uh, 415,000 applications uh, that are pending, which means that they've been mailed in and they're just sitting there. So, uh, you know, hopefully things move and things get better here soon. Lucas, in this scenario, if primary applicant 485 got rejected, um, even if primary applicant is rejected, derivatives application also rejected, right? Yes. Okay. So if if maybe if if any possibility to resubmit this application, they can submit the primary applicant and the derivative application along with one single packet. Correct. I, I have okay. come across one of our viewers uh, uh, emailed me with this uh, situation where um, they had a unique circumstance where one of the their their entire package was uh returned because they submitted checks for the adjustment of status application and i'm sorry they for the i-140 downgrade there was a check and then for the adjustment status applications they wanted to pay with credit card so typically you're not uh, permitted to file mixed uh methods of payments if you pay by check all have to be check if you, or money order if you pay using the form for credit card transaction, all have to be paid the same way. So that was one recent, you know, rejection that kind of, uh, you know, was a little probably outside the normal scope of what normally gets rejected. And it's a, it's a bit comical because even though everything was mailed in one package, probably you could argue that each submission 
was its own package itself, so it would not qualify to be rejected. So, you know, we hear a lot of, you know, odd circumstances on the rejection reasoning. So hopefully we can get all these corrected and move forward. Okay. Lucas, so we do have the another question from YouTube from Srivastava. Uh, GCEAD, can GCEAD be approved and issued without biometric completed or I-140 approval? Have you seen any such approvals received who fill in October 2930? EB3 downgraded and file 485. EAD and uh, advanced payroll. I, I've had a few clients already receive their EAD and advanced parole. Um, those pe those who have already received it, I, I believe they might have been a supplement J, so they weren't a downgrade case. But you know, once once you file uh, the concurrent filing, it doesn't necessarily mean it, if it's a supplement J or not. Um, once the applications are accepted each case process is the same i've had a lot of people ask me is it okay to go ahead and upgrade a premium for my i-140 to get this moving faster and unfortunately the answer is no uh, if you do premium on i-140 i-140 will be approved but there's no rush to get the eads uh and advanced paroles uh approved in the same you know two-week time frame <clears throat> okay so i think his question is um will get GCEAD without biometrics? Uh, no. Um, if there was biometrics still on file, maybe if you had like a uh, H4EAD or something like that and it's still fresh, maybe. But typically, especially if you're H1, uh, biometrics are going to be required. Um, and, and if they're not required, there's some circumstance where they have your file on record uh, and it's within a certain uh, time frame. That they could they can reuse it more or less. Okay, so we can go for another question. So how? So so how? I have my AOS is pending for more than one eighty days. I am currently working as consultant for a client IT department, and now I have an offer from some of some client, but but from payroll department and uh, with the same duties. I think the question is, will I any challenges in porting my AOS application as I am working for business instead of IT department? Well, that is a very good question. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. In the past, the answer would probably be, you know, it wouldn't be that big of a challenge uh, as long as we can show that the job is, is similar. Uh, there was a change probably nine months ago to this porting ability within the field officer's handbook uh, that, you know, is issued by USCIS. So what that means is there's more scrutiny now to make sure that your job is duties are same or similar for the porting. Uh, so you probably need to, you know, speak to your new employer because uh, I would imagine they're still going to have to transfer your H1 uh, and you, at that point of the process, when you're going through that step, you might want to verify that the, the job duties, because that's really what it is. It's not so much uh, the job title. Uh, you know, USCIS has to review the job duties to make sure they're the same or similar to have that porting ability. Uh, and that's what I would recommend. Um, and, and these are very, you know, in the past, it was more straightforward. If you're, you know, a developer, it's a developer you know, it, it, that would qualify. But now there's a little bit more um, uh, background, you know, looking into what the duties are uh, to get that uh, visa ported over or the application ported over. Okay. Lucas, we are discussing 485 adjustment um, supplement J in this scenario. So if, if any... H1 holder or if any 485 adjustment of holder want to change the job, it should be apply the supplement J after 180 days if, if they want to change one company to another company, right? So what is the date? That is, a, let's say, I have, it means if any if anyone apply, submitted the 485 in October, maybe 25th, 
Uh, which date is uh, consider application date or notification date on the receipt? From the rec receipt date, the receipt date, and then you count 180 days from that receipt date. So on the 181st day, you're able to port the adjustment of status application. Okay. So most of uh, this October, October apply for the downgrade. The can you suggest uh, if who are applied it downgraded, they want to transfer the 485 to the another company, maybe without approval of I-140? Can you suggest or what is the recommendation? Yeah, that's very risky because um, if your current employer, whoever petitioned for you, uh, wants to withdraw that I-140 while it's pending, uh, then obviously your adjustment of status application will be denied and there's no purpose to that you're not able to port at that point. So you'd have to go back through and do the uh, perm process and wait for another priority date. So what I would recommend is, you know, you want to make sure that you have an approved I-140 unless it's just an emergency. Um, and then you want to wait after the I-140 is approved. You want to wait for six months so that your employer cannot revoke the I-140. Once once you, you're at that stage, uh, the way the Supplement J works is you can go uh, to a different employer and, you know, you can, however way this works, e either through the GCEAD or if you transfer your H-1 or whatever status you have, uh, you go to the other employer. As long as the job is same or similar, uh, you know, that's that's sufficient. Now, what do, what do you have to do when I say Supplement J? Well, you don't have to do anything uh, until it, USCIS notifies you, uh, you know, hey, we need an RFE because we're processing your case and we need to make sure that you're still employed with the same employer or you have the same or similar job function and duty with a different employer. And, you know, you'll get an RFE in the mail and, uh, you know, you, all you have to do is have your current employer fill that out and then send it back in with the RFE and, and they'll continue processing the case at that time. Okay. Lucas, adding one more question from Shivaji. Uh, he's asking how long one can stay without work after 180 days of adjustment of status? Well, if I understand correctly, it's if you're out of status for 180 days. Is that the question? I think Shiva, the question is not clear. Maybe if you give them more detail, maybe we can address. I think, I think what he's referencing is the waiver. So, you know, for employment based, uh, what happens is you, you have up to six months, 180 days. Uh, maybe if you have unlawful presence or you're out of status, they can be waived, uh, you know, but um, if you exceed that, the waiver is not available and you won't be able to continue adjusting your status. So, you know, this is something that, that is unique to employment based applications. Um, if you are, for example, if we look on the other side, if you go to a family based uh, application, uh, as long as you enter the country with permission, uh, but you fall out of status, like you overstay a visitor visa or you came here as a student and then you lost your SEVIS and you're out of status, you can, even if it's two or three, 10 years down the road, you can still adjust your status based upon, uh, you know, the family relationship at that point. Uh, so it's a, in context, you can look at it one way on the family base. There's not really a penalty for it. Employment side, you have a, up to six months uh, of unauthorized presence. Okay. Lucas, uh, one question is, my priority date is current. I'm planning to travel to India on EAD and uh, advanced payroll. What happens if GC, GC is issued? Can I still use my EAD to travel back? So, yes. So the advanced parole allows you to go ahead and, um, uh, you know, get your, uh, uh, to travel and get back in the country and everything else. Now, Whenever you're saying if GC is issued, you know, if your final action date's current and they're working on your case, uh, 
you know, your GC could be issued uh, and then you can come back in. Now, it's very important. I had someone else ask me this today. What it, what's the longest uh, duration I can stay outside the United States on uh, EAD advanced parole? And typically, uh, of course, there, there's always an exception to uh, if there's an emergency or something else. But typically, you need to be to return to the United States before the expiration on that advanced parole. OK, uh, currently, advanced parole and EADs are issued only for one year at a time. So it kind of limits the ability to travel and what you need to do uh, just because you don't have access to those documents. So um, it, it, based upon that logic, uh, it should, you know, I mean, you would know if your case is really close to uh, getting GC because you're going to probably have to go in for an interview. Uh, you're going to have to send an RFE in with your medicals, with your supplement J, so that that scenario probably wouldn't, happen unless there was just a dire emergency where you had to travel but you would probably have notice or knowledge that you're getting close to your gc being issued because you would receive these other notices okay lucas i have a one question on h4 h4 extension has been denied case was applied through nunk pro trunk mm -hmm. how many days depend has to leave u.s border Right. Typically, there's 20 days that you can, you know, depart. Uh, obviously, right now, if there's an issue where you it travels difficult or you, there's a health problem or something like this, you can always go to the uh, airport with your ticket purchase and your itinerary and you can request a deferred departure. OK, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, this was something that it was just issued all the time that you could get a deferred departure from uh, Customs and Border Patrol, and it wouldn't be an issue. Now there's a little bit more scrutiny involved. Uh, maybe it's more of a case-by-case -case decision. It, obviously, where you go, if it's DFW Airport, um, LAX, if it's uh, Atlanta, all these international airports kind of have their own uh, flavor of, of their own policies of what they would accept. Uh, so it's not something that you're guaranteed, but it's something you could definitely request. And like I said, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was something easily acquired. Uh, but now it's becoming more and more difficult. So if there is any uh, like underlying health condition where, you know, you, you're afraid of travel, the vaccine's not yet available uh, or some other uh, problem, you can take that evidence along <clears throat> with the plane ticket and, and the itinerary and show that to the Customs and Border Patrol officer at the, at the port of entry at the airport, and they'll give you what we call uh, uh, that deferred departure. And, uh, you know, if the same situation's there when the deferred departure expires, typically it's about a three-month period, then you can go back again and request an additional deferred departure without accruing unlawful status. Because this is the first time I'm seeing this Nunk Pro Trunk. What is this, actually? when the USC is issued on this one? So Nunc Pro Tonk is a Latin term that pretty much uh, in layman's terms is, is like you're going back to fix something, right? So it's like uh, if, if you, uh, uh, to put it simple, if a Nunc Pro, Tonk is, Nunc Pro Tonk is accepted, it's pretty much USCIS approving um, a decision and, and that that decision is effective from the previous date, okay? So if there was some, typically it has to be uh, due to circumstances outside the control of the non-immigrant. The non-immigrant has to be maintaining their status, uh, as, as, you know, whether it be if you're H4, F1, whatever it might be. Um, you, you have to uh, not be in removal proceedings and you have to not have violated any non-immigrant status uh, any other way. So there's four points to it. Uh, typically, we see this the most common in H-4s where, you know, maybe an employer didn't file the H-4 extension at the same time when they filed the H-1B extension. Maybe, you know, there's m multiple multiple reasons for this. Uh, but if that did happen and the Nug Pro Tunk did not work, um, you would still have the option, hopefully, of going and getting a deferred departure, uh, especially if it's an H-4 uh, and you have kids uh, you could go, you know, for family unity purposes, it's not the right time to travel, COVID, things like this. 
you that would be the next step to try and you know make sure you don't accrue unlawful presence. Okay. Uh, Shiva uh, provided the more details. The previous question. His question is: uh, I-140 approved, and uh, it more than 180 days. The 485 is up filled. Do we have any timelines? Time limit before I switch to another employer. Like uh, for H1, we have the 60 days grace period. No limits on that whatsoever. Um, and that these laws, I want everyone to remember, these laws are put into effect not to hinder you or to impact your life in a negative way. These are positive uh, uh, adjustments to our laws to to allow you to have the freedom to move from one employer to the other to where you don't feel like you're um, maybe stuck one place where, where you have other opportunities elsewhere. So, you know, uh, these are these laws were created with the intention of allowing you to have mobility uh, as things change, because this process does take a long time, uh, to, you know, start and finish with this GC process. We all understand the longevity of this uh, process. So the, these changes and implementations were, were made to help uh, each individual uh, move from one opportunity to the another opportunity with, without any uh, negative imp impact on them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. We are at, we are reaching at seven p.m. Central Time. Maybe we are we are at the end of the show. So thank you, Lucas. Uh, today, address about the fiscal H one B twenty twenty two cap and. Um, a lot of uh, the priorities of immigration H one B, the Biden administration policies. So thank you uh, each and everyone who participated today and uh, your valuable questions. We keep trying to provide the same momentum to this this uh, immigration community to uh, from Telugu Radio. We are trying to simplify USA immigration and we are trying to. Uh, educate to each and everyone on USA immigration so that uh, you can take a you can take a right direction based on your scenarios and uh, your situations. So thank you each and everyone who participated today and uh, each and everyone who tuned Telugu NRA radio the weekly webinar. Thank you from Telugu NRA radio and uh, Burgos and La Forum. We can continue to the show every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time. We can, we, if if any questions missed today, we can uh, address in next Wednesday, and you can post, uh, you can post, you can maybe you can send an email to directly Lucas info at uh, BG IMM Law. Get more information if you have any complicated uh, the scenario, maybe. Uh, recommended to send email to Lucas and get more information. Your case or scenarios. Uh, thank you today. Uh, ending the show, Lucas. You can say the end of the show. Yeah, you can address well, what if you if you anything miss. I'll, I'll take a, a minute. I just want to thank everyone who participated tonight. Um, it, it benefits uh, not just uh, us. Uh, but it helps the commu community. So any any question, whatever it might be, you know, please uh, share because there's probably someone else with a similar question or need that that's going to benefit from it. And uh, you know, Venkat and I will uh, tune in uh, and have an emergency show if anything uh, changes in regards to uh, you know uh, positive news and uh, you know. That, you know, a lot of things have been changing uh, the past couple of weeks, so just stay tuned. Follow us on our Facebook pages for Telugu and our NRI Radio, or Burgos and Garrettson Law at BGM Law, uh, and uh, we'll try and update as soon as we hear any uh, positive news or any news that might impact uh, our, the viewers. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Thanks for joining today, and uh, bye bye until next Wednesday. See you. Bye.